but I will take care of that before I leave. I have it, I just have to, I just have to upload it. So there are some for you to practice on and calculate out. Okay, reticulocytes. sites. We have a couple of different ways we can re report reticulocytes. sites. Um, the retic in and of itself is useful, but it's even more useful if we compare it to what's going on with the patient's condition. Um, so, if you've got your retic worksheet there, all right. So, what we're going to do today is, I am going to pretend that I ran all of your stuff on the analyzer. And when I ran it, everybody's specimens got a red count, your first one, the one that you did, that you guys diluted up and made. Everybody got a 5.0 for the red count. So on your sheet, where it says RBC, what's the first one, is it hematocrit or RBC? RBC. On your sheet, the patient that you diluted up, under RBC, write 5.0 arbitrarily assigned because this number is I'm pulling it out of three thin air. The hematocrit, what would the hematocrit on a red count of five? What would the hematocrit be? Here for take away. Mm -hmm. My red count's five, what should my hematocrit be? What should my hemoglobin be? Normal. Numerically. If my red count's five, my hemoglobin should be about three times that, right? Smile and nod. So my hemoglobin would be about 15. So if my hemoglobin's 15, what's my crit? 45-ish. About 45-ish, yeah. So I like 45, that's a nice round number. Okay, so we're going to go on the one that you guys diluted up, the red count of five, of 45, okay? This is the one you diluted up. The one that Lorian made up, we're gonna give it different numbers, okay? Build up calculations for you. All right, so what's the next line? Retics counted, right? So you should have written yours slash your partner's. That's what should be in that line. So to figure out total retics counted, add them. So add them together and circle that number. And I wanted you to put them separately so that I could see how well you match. Again, this is that miscellaneous testing that is in here just so you don't have to take notes in that. We have three different ways to report this. The relative retic re count, the absolute retic count, oh no, we're back to absolute counts. They're going to haunt you forever. And the last one is the corrected reticulocyte count. This last one you probably will learn to calculate here in class and never see again. Very few people use this one, but I have to show it to you because it does pop up. The relative is simply the percentage of retics. Nothing exciting and difficult. How many red cells do you count? How many total cells do you count when you do a retic? A thousand. A thousand. So how do I determine the percentage? Move the decimal point one place over. Okay. So if I counted ten, just because I'm very tired this morning, and so. I can't do hard math, so we're going to do easy math. All right? If I have 10 out of 100 and the definition, or 10 out of 1,000, the definition of percent is the number per 100. 
So if I divide that by 10, I've got to divide that by 10. Just move the decimal point one place to the right. That's it. Simple, 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 simple. And that is going to equal 1%. So I want you to take your number, and I want you, because this is the next line relative. Yes, relative retick count. So take the number where you just added the two together. Do not average the two together. That is the most common mistake I see on the test, is people will average the two together. You will add them for retics. How many decimal points do we report? Usually one, but I'll take zero or one. I ain't that big. Not on this Again, that's going to be formatting based on where you look at. Um, so now you've got your relative, yes? Okay, how did we determine an absolute neutrophil count? Now I don't want to know how I determined absolute neutrophilia. How did I calculate the absolute neutrophil count? Percent times the white blood cell. How do you think we're going to calculate the absolute retic count? Hint. We're going to take the percent and multiply it by the red count. This is why I had to give you the red count. Okay, so this is my relative. My absolute is going to be 0 0.01 because that is 1% as a decimal, right? basic math. Times my red count. Second example of this because I was an idiot and picked up 45. So we're going to take so my corrected retic is going to be one percent. times the patient's hematocrit over what is standardly considered a normal hematocrit, which is 45, and that's why picking 45 was stupid, I'm sorry. So my corrected is also going to be 1%. This number is going to change when I change that hematocrit. So it's the patients over the average? Over 45. Patients, patients over 45. They pick 45, and that's the number we use every time. Okay, so there's our first example. Okay, what kind of numbers did we get on the one we all did together? 
How much did you get on it? One. One. You did not get to it, okay? 135. Okay, pretty, pretty consistent, actually. Um, when you're counting that many cells being within, you know, 20, 25, this is pretty good. We're going to make it easy because I'm tired. We're going to make it 110. Just put it like that. That's a good number. All right, we counted 110 for 1,000 cells. I'm gonna give you five minutes calculating everything else out. Gives me time to go get my calculator. We're using those numbers as red and red. Oh, sorry, I gotta give you new numbers. Um, no. We're going to use. Okay, this person was anemic, that's why their retake count was up. So we're gonna use a red count of three. So approximately, what should my crit be? Nine. About 27? Or 27. But I like Okay, in the last equation, you used the retick percentage not converted to a decimal. All right, so quick and simple, what's our relative? 11%. Move the decimal point. One point to the left. Okay. What's my absolute? 0.33. And I do recommend you put a zero in front of the decimal point. Decimal points have a tendency to get lost on handwritten documents. 0.33 times 10 to the 6 per millimeter cube. And what's my corrected? 6.1. Do we agree with that? Do we want to figure the corrected one out together? Mm -hmm. Y'all got the absolute one right. That one's easy enough. I'm a little confused on the absolute. Do you just automatically go over one more time or what? I convert my percentage to a decimal, which means move two points to the left. That's basic math. Okay. okay. Or if you're in your calculator, you can just multiply your red count times 11%. Sure. Okay. okay. So, yeah, we're, we have to convert that percentage to a decimal in order to use it in a mathematical calculation. Okay. All right. So the corrected is going to be 11 because we use our. Um, Relative percentage not converted, not converted. So 11% times 25 over what? 45. Over 45. This bottom number in this equation is always 45. Always. If you get someplace out there that actually does this calculation, and they tell you something different, text me back, let me know. As far as I know, it is always 45. So the entire thing's not over 45. This number, number 45. is always 45. Yeah, but the entire thing isn't over 45. It's just counted over 45. It's math. It doesn't matter. This is the same as mathematically. Take my crit of 25, divide it by 
divided by 45 and I get like 0.5. Okay. Then I multiply that, or 0.6, I'm sorry, multiply that by the 11 and I get 6%. Does that make sense? At least doing the calculations. I don't care, one decimal point, zero decimal points. I mean, good either way with free text. We do, the only one that we do have kind of a standard, when we report the absolutes, we do usually report that to two decimal points, just like we do the red cells. Okay, red cells go to two decimal points, so does absolute free text, because they are a form of red cell. Everyone understand what we're doing? Yeah. I'm confused as to why you're using the relative because that's what, what I'm correcting. I am correcting the relative percentage for the drop in hematocrit, for the variation in hematocrit. I'm, that, this corrected retake, what I'm correcting is my relative count. What this is basically telling me is that if I had a patient who wasn't anemic, if the patient wasn't a little anemic to start with, that their red, their hematic, ugh, I'm so sorry guys. If I had a patient who was not anemic to start with, their retic count would be about six. I'm not quite sure what that tells me. There will be several of these on the test. So if you know how to do these, easy peasy points. If you don't know how to do these, you're going to be in trouble. To be clear, there are also going to be some more of those, um, the tech didn't do the test right, counting problems. I gave full credit last time, no matter how you figured it out. Okay. Next time, it has to be in that formula. The whole purpose of doing this is so you understand how to use the formula. When you get into body fluids, you will thank me for torturing you now. Because right now it's easy, okay, if my dilution's twice what, what my normal dilution is, yes, I'm just going to multiply my answer by two. But what if I tell you that I counted the fluid, I counted all nine of the large squares, and I only diluted it one to four? I can't logic that one out quite as easily as the other ones. So I want you to put it into the formula itself. And like I said, the whole reason is to teach you, to get you more comfortable with it. Because when you get into the fall, into body fluids, when you have three full classes going simultaneously and you're overwhelmed, wouldn't it be nice to already have that piece under your belt where you're not getting confused? Okay. Yes? First slide. Okay, I can, I can do that. I don't put in there to convert it to a decimal. Okay, I can easily do I haven't redone this one in probably five years. No, I'm just saying. Just no, that's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you. I also want to put an example in here. I don't have that. question and I gave you, I think I gave, I don't remember if I gave you full or partial credit, because you calculated out the white count based on the first count the tech did, 
probably not the one I wanted you to use. But that's okay. I gave you some credit for doing it, and I don't remember who it was, and I don't actually care. Um, but make sure you read through the question entirely before you, you, you put it up. But I'm telling you, point blank, it's going to be on there. So know the formula, know what goes into what blank on the formula. And like I said, it's, it isn't because I want to torture you or I enjoy this. It's because I want to make sure you're comfortable with that formula. In fact, is next year I'm taking the 250 and the 10,000 out of that. It's, it's not even going to be in there for you guys to, to confuse future students. It's just going to be gone. Everyone's going to have to go from the basic formula. Because you know how many times you're going to do whole blood, white, and red counts in your career? I haven't done a medical red count outside of class. 19, yeah, before some of you were born. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've done this count out of class. How often might you do body fluids? Not uncommon. Okay, we do most of them on the analyzer, but if they're real sticky, or if you don't have an analyzer that can do them, or a lot of times spinal fluids are still done manually because there's such a small amount of it. So body fluids are something that you may wind up counting manually. And with those, um, I, there's, and I'm, Jean, I don't know if Jean goes through it, but I mean, what happens if I've got an analyzer that needs 200 microliters of fluid to run, and I only have 100 microliters of fluid? Do I just tell the doctor I can't do the cell count? No. I dilute it up. So it does happen. If we have spinal fluid on a baby, they only got us a half a cc to do everything. And it takes a quarter of a cc to do the chemistry. So there's no way around that. I can't do those manually. So that left us with a quarter with 0.25 mils to do a cell count, a gram stain, and a culture. So Sometimes you get tiny, tiny amounts, you got to make more. Yes? Isn't the room for error a great deal higher with such a small amount? Yes, but it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. And there have been times we've called the doctor and said, okay, which do you want? Because you ain't getting it all. And then we have done that. And I had one physician chewed me up one side and down the other and I said, you gave me this much. I do not have enough to do everything. What is your priority? What do you want? Well, of course I want the, okay, of course you want that, but Dr. So-and-so always wants something else. So. All right. There is, like I said, that uh, of the retic production index. There you go. You've seen it? <laughs> no. Again, this is not something that um, this is not something that I know anybody who reports out anymore, or I don't know anybody who ever did report it out. Um, what we do report out, which is not on here, which I probably need to start including, which is what I think this was initially. We report out from the analyzer something called the IRF, which is the immature retic fraction. Basically, this is what this retake product, or this RPI is. The IRF is something that is measured by the analyzer. If I'm correct, they measure the actual amount of RNA that is in the cell. But basically, what an IRF tells me, what is a retic? It's an immature red blood cell. When we talked about families and needing money. We said we picked the teenagers out, right? Well, the IRF is kind of what's the average age, you know? Have I got 18, 19-year-olds? Have I got 
13, 14 year olds. How young are my retics? Okay. How many really, really young red cells are being released? Okay. That's all we will talk about IRF. As far as the normal ranges, which are on here, okay, you only need to know the adult normal range for the reticulocyte. If this does not match your other sheet, which one do we go by? The other sheet. Because I don't remember what it is. I don't remember what it is on here. Yeah. Zero point five. That's the same as power. Well, it's the same thing for Right. Yes, so zero point five to two point five. I'm going to be taking normal ranges out of everything except that one PowerPoint. I'm not going to ask you to remember. Um, sed rates and retics are going to be on this test, yes? All right, now to the fun stuff. Bone marrow failure. Not too long, I got bone without a number of times. Not too. It'll be just like a few questions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've got a few questions. Okay. Not hours. <laughs> All right. We talked yesterday about iron deficiency anemia. Basically what it is, is that your bone marrow is working, everything's working fine, but you don't have all the pieces and the parts to say what you need. When we're talking about bone marrow failure, something has happened to make your bone marrow not make red cells and white cells and stuff as well. We can have primary bone marrow failure, and that means that that is the cause. It is, it is primarily it is the first cause. It's not caused by something else, but the bone marrow just in and of itself has decided to stop working. There are certain hereditary conditions which lead to bone marrow failure. For some reason, the mechanism just shuts down. Idiopathic, anyone know what an idiopathic is? No, they don't. That's the whole point. Idiopathic means we don't know. Some idiot caused the disease. We don't know what causes it. It just, for some reason, it stops working. We can also have secondary bone marrow failure, which means that our bone marrow fails because of something else that is going on in our body. It can be induced chemicals. There's a lot of chemicals out there that can induce it, or drugs. If I'm doing chemotherapy, what do you think is going to happen to my bone marrow function? A lot of our chemotherapeutic agents, their whole job is to stop neoplastic cells, to stop rapidly dividing cells. Where in your body? more than the bone marrow do you have rapidly dividing cells. Okay. So when we're trying to fight those abnormal proliferations of cells, the cancers, okay, whether they're bone marrow cancer or other types of cancers, a lot of those drugs are targeting the cell reproduction because for the most part, most of the cells in our body don't reproduce very rapidly. Our blood cells, on the other hand, reproduce a lot. And so if we're targeting rapidly producing cells, a lot of the set, a lot of those chemotherapeutic agents are also going to cause our bone marrow to stop working. They're getting better. We don't have near as much problem. They're not using as broad spectrum. They're getting things narrowed down a little bit more, but it still happens. Radiation. 
whether it's from radiation exposure, whether it's from radiation treatments for cancer and things like that, but in uh, exposure to radiation will cause leukemias and it will also cause bone marrow shutdown. Yes. Okay. The big hype when the, the airports were doing all those scans and stuff, those don't put out nearly enough to actually cause any kind of bone marrow issues. I can't them. speak to that. I do not know. You'll have to ask my niece who's the radiology tech. Okay. That's her. Infectious, if you get bacteria growing in your bone marrow, they kind of eat all the good stuff and there's not enough for your bone marrow to work. Immunologic, for some, and there are some people who for some reason their uh, immune system decides that the bone marrow is a foreign invader and they need to destroy it. One of the times we'll see this is after a bone marrow transplant. That's a bad thing. It's a very and the last is malignant infiltration if your cancers metastasize to the bone marrow. Pancytopenia, just break it down. Pan means world or overall. Cyte means cell. And EDM means a decrease. Okay? So overall, everything decreases. That's all the word means. We're going to see a decrease noted according to the lifespan. We've talked about this before. First thing we're going to see is thrombocytopenia. The number of people coming in with bone marrow failure or bone marrow problems because of bruising. Probably the number one thing we see them for is a lot of bruising. Next we see a leukopenia, and then that will be followed by an anemia, and very importantly, an anemia without retics. Okay? In other words, I'm going to have an anemic patient. And if my patient is anemic, their retic should be up. But what I find is an anemia without an increase in my retics. Depending on the severity of the shutdown, it's going to depend on how low my retic count is going to be. The symptoms vary as the cell counts decrease. Like I said, thrombocytopenia is bru bruising. Leukopenia, you're going to start having a lot more bacterial infections. Um, viral too, but the lymphocytes kind of do their own thing outside the bone marrow too. So we primarily see bacterial infections first. And then in the anemia, once you get that far. But how long is it going to take for that anemia to start showing up once the bone marrow shuts down? A couple of months, right? Because your red cells live for four months. Now we don't make them and replace them all at one time, so it's a gradual kind of thing. But it takes a couple months for them to really start dying off in any amount to become significant to us. When's my retic going to drop? Pretty much within the first couple weeks. So I will see that drop in retics long, long, long before I see any of the anemia symptoms showing. Hematologically, I'm going to find a white count less than three. My red count's going to be less than three. Platelets are going to drop down below 100. It's not going to change the morphology. It's not going to affect what my red cells look like. I'm just not going to have as many of them. My retic is going to go down to less than 0.5, less than 1 if I correct it for you. The bone marrow is going to be hypocellular. What the heck is a hypocellular? cells. My bone marrow shutting down. I'm not going to see the precursor cells in there. It is shutting down. I'm not, they're going to start dying and they're not going to be replaced. It may produce a dry tap simply because there's nothing in there to suck out. Okay. Not like our hairy cell where it's so infiltrated that you can't get it out. In this case, there's just nothing here to pull. Yes. What's the end death ratio of marrow to fluid or Mer uh, myeloid to fat. Sorry, myeloid to fat. Yes. How would you differentiate between the dry tabs? Other tests? Other tests. The only thing you can tell from a dry tab is you ain't getting anything out of here. So without the cells, there still wouldn't be that. There's going to be 
need more fat. And as the fat increases, the ratio decreases. Yeah, but you're saying the fat comes in to take over when the when the myeloid cells vacate, mm -hmm. the fat moves in. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what these cells go. Okay, the fat takes in. You can't have hollow bones. The body has to put something in there. And most of us have enough fat that we can eat. So once the fat's in the bones, though, is that recoverable? What's that? Once the fat is in the bones, is that recoverable? Well, if yeah, you can down. squish it back out. Okay. Yeah. The, the myeloid cells will take over, though. If you can get the bone marrow going again, it'll repopulate. Okay. Aplastic anemia, about 75% of these cases just happen. No idea why. About 25% of these cases happen because something else causes it. This is the most common of the bone marrow failures, and aplastic simply means without formation. So this isn't a big fancy word, it's just telling me I eat making red cells anemia. Okay. So it's, again, big words, but you know, we, can, we can sound really smart and fancy, but all we're saying is your bone marrow ain't making red. The red or active marrow is replaced by fat. It does happen more commonly in older people, but that is not necessarily the case. It can be seen in children. For some reason, it does appear more commonly in, patient, in uh, people of East Asian descent. I don't know what the correlation is. That's all I know. You know all the information I have on that. Like I said, most cases are idiopathic, but about a quarter of them are 20, or about 25% of them are something that was done to the patient that causes it. How do I treat it? Well, if I give you something that made your bone marrow stop, maybe I should stop giving it to you. Okay. This would be most common in things like um, sulfur drugs in children. One of the lowest platelet counts I ever saw was a 2,000. Of course, you might just tell me we'll grow up, we'll prove that pigtails comes running in. We wouldn't let her leave. We did her plate account and it was 2,000. Oh man, the phlebotomist clotted it. We're gonna try again. Nope, the phlebotomist, we apologize for saying you clotted it. You didn't clot it. So we drew her a second time. We drew her a third time into Unipets and did a manual count. They'd given her sulfa antibiotics and she'd stopped making platelets. Her mom brought her in because she was bruised. Her mom was on the phone the whole time with the office with her phone, with her business office. And we finally told her she had to put the phone down. And we were flying the child to Children's Hospital because they were afraid that if she got a bump on the ambulance ride, they were afraid she'd start bleeding into her brain. Two days later, the plate account recovered. She was perfectly fine and happy, running around, being a cute little kid. But just simple sulfa drugs, they took her off them. Life got better. Um, there's other agents, especially uh, chloramphenicol, a couple of the antibiotics out there that are notorious. On, on those, it doesn't lead to pancypedia. On those, it pretty much just wipes out the uh, platelets first. Usually, you catch it long before it's been going on long enough for it to affect the other cell lines. If it's idiopathic or if it's hereditary, if it's something we really can't fix, pretty much all we can do is support them give them platelets if we have to. Uh, erythropoietin or thrombopoietin are options, but very expensive. And PRBCs is packed red blood cells. Yes? She was on sulfur antibiotics. It only took two days. Yeah, it only took two days. She had an ear infection. And they gave her a sulfur antibiotic, which is very common. And you know, thousands and millions of children take them with absolutely no problems whatsoever. But certain people, sulfa drugs just do something to their physiology. And I mean, she was covered with bruises. You know, but I mean, not it didn't look like beating bruises. You know, knees, <laughs> elbows, shoulders. You know, places where little children run into things all the time. So that's why she was in was for bruising. And believe me, if your kiddos took it and it happened, you'd know just like that because the bruises come up real quick. Yeah, I have toys. 
you have boys. They're always bruised anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what would happen is where now they get bruised, they'd wind up with. Right, they'd be like a, a total bruise. Yeah, they'd be black <laughs> and blue head to toe, pretty much, yeah. We can evaluate them for a bone marrow transplant, and we talked about those when we talked about leukemias. And I don't know what the criteria that they use to determine who's a bone marrow transplant. Fanconi's anemia. This is an autosomal recessive, which means that in order for this to pop up, you have to have both copies. So you got to have two parents who each have the gene for Fanconi's anemia. And pretty much as long as, you know, as long as your family tree branches and it's not a bush, you should be fine. <laughs> <coughs> um, the symptoms are pancytopenia with an increased osmotic fragility. And all that simply means is if I take, okay, if I took my red cells, and not that anyone would do this, and I diluted them in water, instead of in saline, what happens to them? Burst. They burst, okay? That's because of osmotic fragility. All red cells will burst if I put them in water. If I put them in 0.9% saline, what happens? Nothing, they float them on happily. What happens if I decrease that saline concentration? At some point, is going to be where, the pa where that patient's red cells can no longer tolerate the lack of saline or the other way around, the increased saline. It's going to cause them to burst. The increased osmotic fragility in a normal person, I think it's 0.6. Don't quote me on that because I can't remember the exact numbers. Okay. But I think it's like 0.6. In these people, if it's not exactly 0.9, it's gone. Okay. So they can't tolerate any variation in concentration. It makes the red cells much more fresh. Yes? This might be a slightly inappropriate conversation or topic, but um, blood and water do not mix is what I was informed. So right. if the blood cells are hemolyzing, the water is going to turn red, which would essentially mix it, would it not? It's not boiling water. Okay, blood and water don't mix means don't hang water on a patient or you're going to kill them. But yeah. when you can mix them and it's going to be a homogenous... Oh yeah. We dilute a lot of things with water. It's just not if you want the red cells to stay intact. Yeah, people have been killed because somebody hung distilled water instead of saline. Oh my God. Um, there are physical abnormalities that are associated with this Fanconi's anemia. Microencephaly, um, so that's what you're hearing about, like with the Zika virus, where their brain doesn't fully develop, doesn't grow all the way, and they will be mentally retarded when they are born. Um, they tend to be short of stature. Basically, anytime you have a lack of oxygen, and if your bone marrow is not making red cells, you're going to have a lack of oxygen. If you have a lack of oxygen, you're not going to be able to grow well. Okay. Uh, we're going to see people who are short of stature or, or shorter or smaller um, because of a variety of different hereditary anemias. Strabismus, the cross eyed. Okay, the eyes are going to be looking the wrong way. There is often a severe malformation of the kidneys, and this is generally what causes death before, long before the anemia does. Um, it's shut down of your kidneys. Is what kills you. Yes. In dwarfism, would that be because of an no, anemia? No, dwarfism is because of is it triploidy 18. No, triploidy. It, it's it's a different one. It has it has its own genetic all by itself. So it's not an anemia. No, not at all. Just a treatment, the only way to treat it is with the bone marrow transplant. And on, this, on these cases, you're not talking about the stem cell transplants won't work because the stem cells aren't normal to start with. So in this one, it has to be an allo transplant. Okay, it has to come from somebody else. That's all you need to know about Fanconi's. PRC, PRCA, pure red cell anemia, it only affects the red cell precursors, hence the name pure red cell. This is a bone marrow failure that doesn't fail everything, 
adjust your red cells. Uh, the most common of these is diamond black hand syndrome. It is hereditary, it is inherited. You can also have an acquired pure red cell aplasia. Clinical findings, we're gonna find osteoporosis, which means what? What is it? Holes in the bones. Holes in the bones, or weakened bones. But yeah, frequently it does wind up with whole bones. Okay. We sometimes we'll find this because someone breaks the bone. Um, CHF, what's CHF? Congestive heart failure. What's et al? Diane was very tired when she was typing, and it's a faster way of saying and other things. You will see an, a swelling of both the spleen and the liver. You'll have a palpable liver, which on the belly. It is going to be a normal, normal anemia. Again, please remember that the indices are one way you can differentiate all of these anemias. Some people have a much easier time differentiating the anemias based on what they are. I will ask questions on the test, probably not this time, well, maybe this time, about which are normal, normal, and which ones are micro, hypo, and which are macrocytic. Okay. This time is going to be pretty easy. If the bone marrow, if the if the bone marrow is failing, it's going to be normal, normal. If you don't have iron, it's going to be micro hypo. So we only got two choices on this test. Okay, so pretty straightforward, pretty simple. But as we go along, we might want to keep an eye on which ones are microcytic, which are macrocytic, and which are normocytic. And remember, the diseases didn't read the book. We will see a decreased reticulocyte count. Why? Because the bone marrow is not working. Anytime we have bone marrow failure, there's going to be a decreased retic. Is there going to be a decreased retic in iron deficiency anemia? It's a trick question. Maybe. Depends on how far down the road you are. Once you get to that end stage where you have no iron left, you're not going to be making a lot of retics because you haven't got the reserves to do it. Now, once I start treating you, that retic's going to go back up. And that's because the body's trying to correct itself. So. Try to keep breathing. Why do they have to have breathing? Congenital dyserythropoietic anemia. Huh? Congenital. My mommy and daddy give it to me. Okay. Dys, abnormal erythro red cell formation. Okay. I inherited ugly red cells. That's all that means. Clinical findings, I have anemia. The most important thing I'm going to see on the lab findings, this is going to be macrocytic. I won't put this one on the test as one of your options, so don't remember that whole macrocytic thing today. Okay. Or megaloblastic. We are going to have an entire lecture on megaloblastics, okay? So just file that one away for future. But what we're going to see is the erythrocytic precursors are going to look ugly. You're going to have a segmented erythrocyte. I have a seg segmented polychromatophilic normoblast. Doesn't that sound fancy? Okay. All right. We're going to see abnormal chromatin patterns in these things. Uh, sometimes they look like they have the measles. Sometimes they look like they have the mumps. Blotches all over them. Uh, I can have multinucleated red cell precursors. Is that normal? Is it normal to have more than one nucleus in your red cell precursors? Which cell is it normal to have? Multinucleus. What is it? Megakaryocytic mm -hmm. uh, platelet precursors. Um, <laughs> that will not. You might see cabot rings. That's the one I showed you the picture and said I've never seen these before. But you might see cabot rings. How common is this? We talked about, you know, horses, zebras. This is like <laughs> You 
you certainly are not going to be. If you ever see this in your lifetime, please remember me and send slides. You're just not going to see this very often. This one you're going to see fairly commonly. Um, by fairly commonly, I mean you, you could possibly see it before you die. Um, myophysic anemia. I say that one three times fast. And no, I have no idea what physic is. I think somebody had a typo and just didn't want to admit it, so now we all have to say this. It's an infiltration of bone marrow by malignant cells. Most commonly, we see this with cancers metastasizing. We also see it with tuberculosis or other mycobacterium. Okay, TB is, is just one type of type mycobacterium, but we see others. Histoplasma, histoplasma which is a fungus. Okay, but we will see these things infiltrate into the bone marrow. This is another one of those things that when I was going through school, remember I went through school when AIDS was still the gay disease in San Francisco? Okay, so, oh, we never see these things, except, and Dr. Neibauer is the one who treated them, and Dr. Neibauer's patients were seeing this a lot. You see these weird granulomas, histoplasma and, and TB. Normally those are taken care of by your T cells. So in an AIDS patient, things that in, a, in most people you would never see, they're, you're seeing them again because of the T cell problem in our AIDS patients. So they get what we call, well not what we call, what I call weird infections, or things that are not common. It's not that they get the common cold or they get uh, sepsis. They'll get tuberculosis and mycobacterium infections of the liver and just fungus diseases and things that that are fairly uncommon, especially in the developing world. Clinical findings, we're going to see bone pain and fragility. Well, if you think about it, if there's something in your bone marrow pushing out, that's going to get very uncomfortable. We're going to see pancytopenia. Again, our cell lines are all going to drop. Our lab finding, uh, our treatment, and I hate to say this, this is just absolutely a horrible thing to say, but plan your funeral because this really, if it gets far enough along to where the bone marrow is replaced by these things, your chances are slim. I have seen patients recover from it. I have seen them get better, but sometimes we have to be realistic. And aggressive antibiotic therapy will sometimes help in infectious cases. Aggressive radiation and chemo for malignancies will sometimes help, but for the most part, once your bone marrow has been replaced by something else, it's very, very difficult to get it back and to recover from that. If they do, you're obviously going to be highly susceptible to reoccurrence. And the cancer patient doesn't even have the immune system to recover from that, right? Not usually. And like I said, I know that putting it on there, burying them is, is really bad, but this is this is what my grandmother died from. She had breast cancer, didn't get it taken care of, and by the time they found it, it had infiltrated all of her bones. There was just nothing more to do. And sometimes admitting, admitting when it's time is something that we all have to fix. Getting closer for me every day. Okay, this isn't bone marrow failure, <laughs> but I don't know where the hell else to put this. <laughs> so we're sticking it on here. Um, and that's because these actually, oops, because these actually, these you're going to see a lot. Bone marrow failure, not so much. These you're going to see a lot. Okay, so they really, honestly, they weren't in any of the PowerPoints for a while, and I realized nowhere in here do I have <coughs> anemia caused by renal failure, and that's one of the most common ones we see. The main reason we see this is because if your kidneys are failing, the sensors that bind the hypoxia are failing, so you don't make erythropoietin, and if you don't make erythropoietin, it can't tell your bone marrow to make more red cells. And bone marrow is extremely lazy. If you don't give it a push in the butt once in a while, it's not going to work. It'd be like, if I don't pay you, I, you're not going to work. 
is always reporting is the paycheck. If you don't pop that in there once in a while, they ain't about to put out any effort. Okay. So you're going to see a decrease. You're going to see an anemia. You're also going to see an increase in uric acid, which is known as uremia. And believe me, Jean and Barb will get into this a lot more. But this, this uremia will affect, affect platelet function because it coats the platelets so the platelets don't work. Did you guys talk about uremic syndrome in coag? Or you don't remember talking about uremic syndrome? Didn't. Okay, with you, we talked about your name, it was the, the clots, fibro, 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 urea, to see if the fibrosis. Okay, no. This is, this is um, actual an increase in uric acid and an increase in BUN actually coats the platelets and they don't function properly, which leads to bleeding, which leads to anemia. Okay. But patients with renal disease, we often see them borderline anemic pretty much all the time. Now, the, these are the patients that really have benefited from erythropoietin because every dialysis patient, almost every month, received a unit or two of blood. Once they came out with EVO, plus they changed the filters and made dialysis better. We stopped seeing quite so bad with the anemia, and I believe it's like once a year they get which is like $5,000, but let's see, $5,000 each blood transfusion is probably close to five by the time, 500 by the time you get done with, you know, buying with the unit and all the costs associated with it. You know, so that's $1,000 a month, so it's actually cheaper. Um, endocrine problems, hypothyroidism, okay, thyroid problems. Will, also, will often lead to a decreased metabolism, which changes the body's oxygen needs. So you don't become hypoxic, and you don't make your red cells. So you slightly become slightly anemic. In this case, a lot of times it's asymptomatic. They, do, they take your blood count, and it's low. You're not having trouble breathing. You're not weak. You're not tired. It just is what it is. Other hormones may directly or indirectly affect erythropoiesis. We already talked about testosterone is a very major stimulant for erythropoiesis. So a drop in, low to, in testosterone is going to decrease your, um, your red count. And in fact, as we see a lot of times in older males as their testosterone drops, their normal ranges actually go back down closer to what Does it make any difference? We don't usually worry about anemia until you're under 10. Even if that's low, they'll investigate and they'll watch it. But for the most part, we're not going to do anything about most anemia. So set maybe give you some vitamins. That's about all they're going to do for you. Now, like I said, please do not confuse. Anemia of systemic disorders is not bone marrow failure. So when that test comes up, question comes up on the test, I just threw them on here because I had to put them